Well, the book of Revelation, as I think we're well aware now, is basically the story of two parallel chronologies of history, one secular and the other religious, speaking, of course, of the development over time of the Roman Empire. And punctuating that history are visions, future visions of the kingdom age, which are there specifically to edify the saints in each of the various judgment epochs of that Roman history. Well, this morning, by way of exhortation, we're going to consider the vision of Revelation chapters 4 and 5. But before we turn there, I want to establish the foundation back in Philippians 2. So come with me to Philippians 2 for the moment. This is a section of verses which is very, very well known to us. I'm speaking, of course, of Philippians 2, verses 5 to 11. Most well known to us, perhaps, in the context of the fact that the church has used these verses to prove the Trinity. But the question for this morning, brothers and sisters, is have you ever read the verses like this? Now, I'm just going to read you verses 5 to 11 of Philippians 2. And as we do so, I know they're well known to you, so as you read down them, paint the picture of what these verses are describing on the canvas of your mind. And by the time we get to verse 11, I'm going to say, what do you see? Now look at this. Let this mind be in you, verse 5, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore, God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Well, what did you see? Well, I suppose in the very centre of the vision you just saw in your mind, you'd have Christ in the centre, of course. Was he standing or was he sitting in your vision? Well, you can't tell from these verses. Uh, what would he look like? Well, he must look something like a servant because verse 7 says that he took upon him the form of a servant. Yes, but he would bear the marks of death, wouldn't he? Because verse 8 tells you that he's been killed. But he's been highly exalted in verse 9. So you might now think that he's a king. And in front of him, verse 10 says, on bended knee is all creation. In fact, it's very specific. All creation, we mean things in heaven, things in earth, things under the earth. That's the angels in heaven, the saints in the earth, the resurrected saints of all ages beneath the earth. And then, of course, in verse 11, there's a great chorus of acclamation because every tongue of those mentioned in verse 10 confesses that he's Lord. So there's the scene, isn't it, of Philippians chapter 2. And perhaps I might suppose that for every one of us, the picture we think of that scene would look slightly different. Perhaps more detail, perhaps less detail, perhaps the amount of detail we would put upon this picture based on just how much thought we've given to these verses over time. But here's the question. If we were to ask how the Lord himself would draw that picture, I mean the Lord who is the subject of this vision, if we were to ask how he would draw this picture, what would he draw? How would he paint the picture or the vision of Philippians 2? Well, of course, the answer is we know already. Come to Revelation 5, because the vision of, of Philippians 2 is precisely described in the vision you have before you in Revelation chapters 4 and 5. Now, how do we know we're right? Well, it's very simple. Do you remember that phrase we read out in Revelation, sorry, in Philippians 2 verse 10? It spoke of things in heaven, things in earth, and things under the earth. Well, that is the precise words of Revelation 5, verse 3. And again, the precise words of Revelation 5 and verse 13. Can you see the point, therefore? When we come to the book of Revelation, you see, this is the revelation of Jesus Christ. It's not the revelation of John. 
It's the revelation of Jesus Christ which he gave to John. What we're saying here, simply speaking, is that Revelation chapters 4 and 5 is simply an amplification of the vision you just saw by the Apostle Paul in Philippians chapter 2. And what do you see in the picture of Revelation chapters 4 and 5? Well, of course, in chapter 4 verse 2, you see Christ on the throne. Is he standing or is he sitting? He's clearly sitting. He's on the throne. What does he look like? Well, verse 3 of Revelation chapter 4 says, he looks some combination of jasper and of sardine. Jasper is transparent, a stone that's transparent, and the sardine stone is red. And since he's on the throne, you might suppose he must look something like a king. Well, that's true, but not entirely, because when you come down to chapter 5, verse 6, it says that I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne, and in the midst of the four living ones, and in the midst of the elders, there stood a lamb as it had been slain. So there's the servant bearing the marks of death from Philippians chapter 2, you see? And all creation worships him. Look at chapter 4, verse 10. The four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne. They worship him that liveth forever and ever. They cast their crowns, in fact, before the throne. So there are the saints worshipping the king on the throne. And not just the saints. Look at chapter 5, verse 11. And I beheld and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne and the living ones and the elders. So we've got the saints and we've got the angels. And what are they saying? Chapter 5, verse 12. Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honour and glory and blessing. You see, every tongue confesses that Jesus Christ is Lord. Can you see, therefore, that what you have in Revelation 4 and 5 is simply an amplification of the Apostle Paul's vision of Philippians chapter 2? It's a vision of the kingdom age with Christ on the throne ruling over the world with the saints. All right, very simple. Very simple. So if you were to redraw your picture of Philippians 2, perhaps now you'd add the detail of Revelation chapters 4 and 5. And doesn't the picture change? Now, there's just one thing we do have to prove. How do we know it's Christ on the throne? We've asserted the fact that it's, Christ, it's evidently Christ in Philippians 2. We've suggested that it's Christ in Revelation 4 and 5. How do we know that? Well, one of the best proofs for the identification of the man on the throne is found in chapter 4 and verse 8 of Revelation. It says here that the four living ones had each of them six wings about him, and they were full of eyes within, and they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. And when those living ones gave glory and honour and thanks to him that sat on the throne, who liveth forever and ever, then the four and twenty cast their crowns. Now, how does that help us? We well, ought to make a note or, or reflect the note that you have in your margin that verse 8 at the top of the page, if you have an Oxford like mine, is a quotation from Isaiah chapter 6 and verse 2. So Revelation 4 verse 8 is quoting Isaiah 6 verse 2. Now, how does that help us? How does that prove anything? Well, I'll show you. You come back with me to John 12. Just hold Revelation and come back with me to John chapter 12. You see, what John 12 proves for us is that Isaiah 6 is speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why it's important to understand that Revelation 4 verse 8 is quoting Isaiah 6 because that proves it's Christ on the throne, you see. John 12 verse 37. But though Jesus had done so many miracles before them, yet... They believed not on him, that the saying of Isaiah the prophet might be fulfilled, which he spake, Lord, who hath believed our report, and to whom hath the arm of the Lord been revealed? Now that's Isaiah 53. Keep reading. Therefore they could not believe, because that Isaiah said again, and this is Isaiah 6, he hath blinded their hearts, so, sorry, their eyes, and harden their hearts, they should not see with their eyes, nor understand with their heart, and be converted, and I should heal them. These things said Isaiah when he saw his glory and spake of him. Now, who's the him? Well, the him is the, ne the him in the next verse. 
Nevertheless, among the chief rulers also many believed on him. It's the hymn of verse 37. Though he had done so many miracles before them, they believed not him. What's the point? The point is that Isaiah 6, as the Apostle John quotes it in John chapter 12, verse 40, is speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ. These things said Isaiah when they saw Christ's glory. So when the book of Revelation in chapter 4, verse 8, quotes Isaiah 6, of the four living ones, the seraphim around the, uh, around the man on the throne, you know that the man on the throne is the Lord Jesus Christ because John, in his own gospel, has told you that. All right? Very simple. There's proof positive, therefore, when we come to Revelation 4 of the identity of the man on the throne. Now, that becomes important when we get to Revelation 5 for reasons that have become evident. But let's start back in chapter 4. What did John actually see as this vision opens up? Verse 1 of Revelation 4. After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was, as it were, of a trumpet talking with me, which said, John, come up hither, and I'll show thee things which must be hereafter. Now, a door, the door in verse 1 that's opened, a door is simply an entrance. So if you, if you could think of it like this, John walked in vision out of the Isle of Patmos and into the Kingdom Age. He, he just walked through the door of time into the Kingdom Age and sees an event which is yet to happen in John's future, which he now describes to us. It says here that the door was in heaven. Now, heaven, of course, is the political heavens of the future age. Heaven simply means government. Now, how do we know that? Well, if you haven't got enough references to that from what we've already considered, you might like to simply turn the page to chapter 6, Revelation 6 and verse 13. This is the first of the great earthquakes in the book of Revelation, and it says in verse 13 that the stars of heaven fell to the earth like a fig tree cast its figs. Verse 14, heaven departs as a scroll that's rolled away together. This is the departure of the government of the pagan Roman Empire when Constantine introduced Christianity. So the simple point I'm making is that heaven is government. It's not the place or the abode of God in the context of the book of Revelation. Very simple in Revelation 4 verse 1. And John says what's more, that the voice which spoke to him was the first voice he heard, as it were, of a trumpet. That's a reference to Revelation 1 verse 10 of the angel of that chapter that began to speak to him. So the simple point he's making in Revelation 4 is that the same angel that spoke to him in Revelation 1 is speaking to him again. And immediately verse 2 says, I was in spirit, as it ought to be, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. In spirit, that means symbolically made immortal, carried in the visions of his mind into the future age where Christ is enthroned in the kingdom. The throne... The word throne here, of course, is the key word of Revelation chapter 4. When you have a spare moment, just colour them all in. The word throne occurs 14 times in Revelation 4, and it appears in verse 4 as the words, a couple of times as the word seats. It's the same Greek word. It's the key word of Revelation 4. Now, that's interesting, you know, because in that case, where do you think this throne is? Well, of course, it's in Jerusalem, isn't it? Heaven just means government. What we have a vision of, you see here, is Christ's government in Jerusalem. And the throne in question of verse 2 of Revelation 4 is none other than the throne of David, which in Luke chapter 1 and verse 32, Christ was promised that he would receive. The Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. So what you're looking at is Christ's government established in the city of Jerusalem after the conclusion of the battle Armageddon, of Armageddon, in the future age. Verse 3. And he that sat on that throne was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone, and there's a rainbow about the throne. Now we made the comment that jasper's clear or colourless and that sardine's red. There's a little more to it than that. You come with me to hold Revelation 4. Come with me to Revelation 21. Here's what jasper really means. Oh, yes, it's colourless. It's colourless for a reason, you see. 
In Revelation 21, verse 10, here's the jasper stone. He carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain, and he showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God, and her light was like unto a stone most precious, even like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. So the jasper stone represents the glory of God. That's the point from Revelation 21. All right, so back to chapter 4. What does the sardius mean, or the sardine stone represent? Well, the sardine stone is, is the sardius stone, which is a red stone. I mean, sardius means red. In the Hebrew, when you come to the stones, for example, of the high priest's breastplate, the Hebrew word for sardius is the word odem, similar to the word Adam means red. It's a symbol of flesh. So can you see the point then about the man on the throne in verse 3? He's a blend of the human and the divine, isn't he? He's a combination of the glory of God on the one hand and human nature of or flesh on the other. This is a symbolic representation of the character of the Lord Jesus Christ. A perfect unity of the human and the divine. Interesting, isn't it? So there's another proof, if you like, of the identity of the man on the throne. And then in verse 4 it tells us that we've got Christ on the throne and round about the throne were four and twenty seats, or thrones as it is, and upon those thrones I saw four and twenty elders sitting clothed in white raiment and they had on their heads crowns of gold. Now who are the twenty-four elders then? If it's Christ on the throne, who, who are the twenty-four elders surrounding him? Well there's no mystery here either you see because... It says they're on thrones or seats in verse 4. If you just hop up to the last verse of chapter 3, it says of the saints, To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I've overcome and set, I sit down with my father in his throne. So the saints will have thrones in the kingdom age. It says they're clothed in white in verse 4 of Revelation chapter 4. Well, just turn back one page to chapter 3 and verse 5. And it tells you that of the saints that overcome, the same shall be clothed in white raiment. So there's the second proof. And it says in Revelation 4 that they're wearing crowns of gold. And it tells you of the saints in Revelation 2 verse 10 that they will be given, if they're faithful unto death at the end of the verse, they'll be given a crown of life. And the crowns that you read of, that the 24 elders are wearing in Revelation 4 and verse 4, are, it's the Greek word stephanos, not the word diadem, so they're not kings in Revelation 4 verse 4, they are conquerors. The stephanos is the laurel wreath that was given to athletes who succeeded at the games. These 24 elders are elders that have overcome, you see. They represent the saints as priests, based on the fact, of course, that David in his kingdom had 24 courses of priests, 24 courses of temple singers in 1 Chronicles 24. Christ is on the restored throne of David in Jerusalem. So, of course, there are major overtones with David's kingdom. So there, are, in verse 4, there are the saints as priests, but you know that the saints aren't just priests in the kingdom, they're also kings. Well, you don't have to go far to see the symbol of the saints as kings, because verse 6 says, And before the throne there was a sea of glass like crystal, and in the midst of the throne were round about the throne four beasts. Now, I keep saying four living ones. The reason for that is that the word beast here is the Greek word zoon, from which we get zoology. It just means a living creature. When you, when you go to Revelation chapters 12 and 13, the word beast is the Greek word theron, means wild animal. So these are not four wild animals. These are just four living creatures, or we might say living ones. They're not, it's not like the beast of the earth, the beast of the sea, the great red dragon. They're not beasts like that. They're just four living creatures. And the first living one, verse 7, was like a lion, the second like a calf, the third like a man, and the fourth like a flying eagle. That's what it tells us. Well, these living creatures, as it turns out, are a combination of the cherubim of Ezekiel uh, chapter 1 and the seraphim of Isaiah chapter 6. And the word seraph 
in Isaiah 6 means to burn. So the seraphim are burning ones. Fire, of course, being a symbol of judgment. So the seraphic symbols of Isaiah 6, which is the main reference here, as we found in verse 8, are symbols of the saints in judgment. Well, that's the symbol of the saints as kings, you see. So you can see there's, there's 24 elders around about the throne. They're the saints as priests. There's four living ones about the throne. They're the saints as kings or as judges. So you've got the saints uh, described in two symbols, one of mercy, the other of judgment. One is, king, uh, one is priests, the other is kings around about this throne. And if you had any doubt about why there should be two symbols used of the saints, well, chap look at chapter 5, verse 8. And when he had taken the book, the four and the twenty-four fell down before the Lamb, every one of them with harps and vials, and, which are the prayers of the saints, and they, that is the four and twenty-four of verse 8, sung a new song saying that Christ is worthy to take the book to open it, because he's redeemed us to God by his blood out of every kindred, people, tongue, and nation. So both the four and the 24 have been redeemed from the world. You've simply got two symbols of the saints, one in a manifestation as priests and the other in a manifestation of ki as kings. It's as simple as that. But we've got a significant point that we overlooked back in chapter 4, verse 6. Now, what do you make of this? Before the throne, in addition to the four and the 24, before the throne was a sea of glass like unto crystal. And that's an extremely significant point. Now, why is that? Well, what does it mean that there's a sea of glass? Well, this sea of glass, you see, is the result of the seraphim judging. It's the why is that? What's happening here? Well, you see, Isaiah 57 and verse 20 tells us that the nations are like a troubled sea. Revelation 15 verse 2 tells us that before Christ has completely subdued this troubled sea, he sits on a throne before a sea of glass mingled with fire. So there are judgments that go out into the nations in the 50-year period we've been speaking about, in the period of the seventh vial, and they subdue the sea. By the time you get to the end of the thousand years, brothers and sisters, in Revelation 21 verse 1, at the end of the millennium, there is no more sea. So it's very significant, therefore, when we read in chapter 4 and verse 6 of the sea like glass, what does it mean? It means the world's at rest. The nations have been subdued. All opposition to the rule of the Lord Jesus Christ has been put down. The little stone of Daniel 2 has now filled the entire earth. Christ is in supreme control and there is no opposition. We can date the, prophecy, the, the fulfillment of this, this vision, can't we? We know exactly, therefore, when the vision of Revelation 4 and 5 takes place in time. It happens in year 50. It happens after great Babylon has been destroyed. At the very commencement of the millennial age, the last day, you might say, of the 50th year, that's the vision of Revelation chapters 4 and 5. There's a rainbow in the sky, verse 3. The storm has passed. The judgments are finished. The seven thunders have been uh, issued upon the nations. And the sea is at rest like a mill pond. Christ is now in control of the world. And you want to see the proof of that? Look carefully at the opening words of verse 5. Out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices. That's what it takes to make the sea like glass. Remember the words, lightnings, thunderings, voices. Now come across to Revelation 16. Now I'm taking you here because this is a chapter you're very familiar with. Revelation 16, of course, contains the vials. The seven vials. And from verse 17 of Revelation 16, it's the seventh vial. This is the last 40 years of the 50-year jubilee. Armageddon has just happened in Revelation 16, verse 16. And it tells us in verse 17 that the seventh angel poured out his vial into the air. There came a great voice out of the temple of heaven saying, from the throne saying, it's done. In verse 18, voices. Thunders, lightnings, a great earthquake like there has never been in the history of the world and the destruction of great Babylon in verse 19. 
year 50 of the Jubilee period. You see? So we know exactly where we are in Revelation 4 in the context of the seventh vial of Revelation chapter 16. There's no mystery at all here. What you've got, therefore, in Revelation chapter 4 is a picture of Christ on the throne surrounded by the saints in two applications, priests, kings, the world at peace, uh, voices, thunders, lightnings having been issued upon the, the troubled sea has quelled all rebellion because there is now no opposition to the rule of the Lord Jesus Christ and will not be for the next thousand years. That's the, that's the vision you see of Revelation 4. Now come to Revelation 5 because this is where it gets interesting. The burning question. When we open up Revelation chapter 5, that is the burning question from, from the Lord Jesus Christ, is how did he get on the throne? What did it take to put the Son of God on the throne in Revelation chapter 4? And if the key word of Revelation 4 was the word throne, the key word of Revelation 5 is the word worthy. Worthy. You see, not, not just anybody can sit on the throne <coughs> governing the kingdom age in the future. There's, there's an issue of worthiness that's required. And you'll see that the word worthy appears in Revelation 4, verse 11, the last verse. It appears again in chapter 5, verse 2. Chapter 5, verse 4. Chapter 5, verse 9. And chapter 5, verse 12. And in the... In, in, in terms of the structure of these two chapters of Revelation 4 and 5, you've got to think of it like this. Revelation chapter 4 is a vision of the world at rest 50 years after the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. We call that year 50. Revelation chapter 5 verses 1 to 7 is a parenthetic glimpse back to the first century to the triumph of the Lamb. But when you come to Revelation 5 verse 8, you're back at year 50 again to conclude the vision. So chapters 5 verses 8 to 14 are back into the future. So all you've got in Revelation 4 and 5 is a vision of the future in year 50. And all we're simply saying is chapters 5 verses 1 to 7 is a glance back 2,000 years in time to understand what it took to put the lamb on the throne. He had to be a slain lamb. And then, of course... Revelation 6, verse 1, the Lamb from the first century then opens the seals of the scroll that he took from the hand of the man on the throne. So let's be clear about that. Chapter 4 and chapters 5, chapter 5, verses 8 to 14, year 50. Chapter 5, verses 1 to 7, and then chapter 6 and onwards, first century. You see? But having said all that, now you'll perhaps perceive the problem we've created for ourselves when we come to Revelation 5. Because look at verse 1. And I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the backside, sealed with seven seals. Verse 6. And I beheld and loathe in the midst of the throne and of the four living ones, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as it had been slain, having seven horns, seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, and he came forth and he took the book out of the right hand of him that sat on the throne. You see the problem. How does Christ, in verses 6 and 7, take the book out of the hand of the man on the throne when we've already identified the man on the throne? In verse 1, is Christ. And oftentimes, I think, brothers and sisters, we obscure the answer to that question by using phrases like God manifestation. But, you know, it's really very simple. In his book, 13 Lectures, Brother Roberts explains it like this. Now listen carefully. Listen to what he says. The lamb takes the book out of the hand of him who sits on the throne, which indicates the moment he receives from the Father the knowledge and power to execute the program represented by the seals. Did you understand what Brother Thomas just said? The lamb takes the book out of the hand of him who sits on the throne, which indicates the moment in time which Christ receives from the Father the knowledge and power to execute the program represented by the seals. What Brother Roberts is saying 
is that prior to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, the man on the throne was God. But the throne was given to Christ subsequent to his resurrection because he was worthy. And what Brother Roberts is saying is that in chapter 5, in fact, the man on the throne is God. But we've already identified the fact that in chapter 4, the man on the throne is Christ. So you see the problem, the, the, the riddle we now have to solve. Think of it like this. Here's Alpha's Israel, page 191. Christ had to take a journey into a far country to be presented before the Ancient of Days and to receive from him a kingdom and to return. And there's the clue. Whereabouts in Scripture do you read of the Ancient of Days? Well, there's only one place. Come back with me. Daniel chapter 7. Daniel chapter 7. Not an insignificant chapter, of course, because it's a chapter that deals profoundly with the 2,000-year development of the Roman Empire. But this is a highly significant chapter. Because you see, three times in this chapter, the phrase, Ancient of Days, occurs. You read of the Ancient of Days in Daniel 7, verse 9. You read the phrase again in Daniel 7, verse 13. And you'll read it finally in Daniel 7, verse 22. So who is the Ancient of Days in Daniel chapter 7? And the answer is, it depends which verse you look at. What do I mean? Well, look at this, verse 9. I beheld till the thrones were cast down. The word ought to be till the thrones were established. They are not destroyed, they are established. And the Ancient of Days did sit, whose garment was white as snow, the hair of his head like pure wool, and his throne was like a fiery flame, and his wheels as burning fire. Now that description you have in verse 9 is exactly the description of the man of one in Revelation 1. Hair like wool, garment like snow. A fiery stream issued from before him, and thousands ministered unto him. And it tells you by the time you get down to verse 12 that he is judging the nations of the world. Who's the man on the throne? Evidently the Lord Jesus Christ. Because this action is going to be done in the kingdom age, during the seventh vial period. In fact, it says, look at verse 11. I beheld then, because the voice of the words of the horn spake, and I beheld even till the beast was slain and his body destroyed and given to a burning flame. That's exactly Revelation 19 verse 20, the destruction of the beast in year 50. Uh, so the vision of the Ancient of Days in verse 9 is clearly a vision of the Lord Jesus Christ about to destroy the beast in the 50th year of the Jubilee period, at the end of the seventh vial. All right, verse 22. Until the Ancient of Days came and judgment was given to the saints of the Most High and the time came that the saints possessed the kingdom. Who's the Ancient of Days there? Or well, evidently the Lord Jesus Christ again, because the kingdom has been given to the saints. It's Christ's prerogative to do that. Now look at verse 13. And I saw in the night visions, and, one, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him, and there was given to him, to whom? The Son of Man, in verse 13, and was given to the Son of Man, Dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people and nations and languages should serve him. Who's the Ancient of Days in verse 13? Well, it must be the Father. Because you have the transaction, you see, between the Father and the Son in verses 13 and 14, where the Ancient of Days is giving to the Son of Man a kingdom and power to control it. That's exactly what Brother Thomas said in Elvis Israel, page 191. So you see what's happening here, brothers and sisters? It's as simple as this in Daniel chapter 7. The Ancient of Days is a position. Before the resurrection, that position was occupied by God. After the ascension, it's occupied by the Lord Jesus Christ. This transaction is represented in Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 and 14, as a cloud of angels bringing the Son before the Father to receive the kingdom. It's represented in Revelation 5, verse 7, as the Son taking the scroll out of the hand of the Father to open the rest of Roman history. Matthew 28, verse 18, Jesus said, All power is given to me in heaven and in earth. So no mystery, really, in Daniel 7. But there's the story 
of Revelation 5 verse 7. That's why we can say the man on the throne is different in those two chapters, depending in which year you ask the question. The man on the throne, that is the Ancient of Days, was God, but at a certain instant of time, power was transferred from the Father to the Son, and from that time forward, the man on the throne was Christ. As Peter says, all angels and authorities and of powers being made subject unto him. All right. The interesting thing here, however, is that Daniel chapter 7 doesn't just speak of one transfer of power. You've read verses 13 and 14 speaking of the transfer of power from the Father to the Son. What do you make of verse 22? Until the Ancient of Days came and judgment was given to the saints of the Most High, and the time came that they possessed the kingdom. You've got a second transfer of power, haven't you? And verse 22 is very similar to verse 14, if you start to look between those two verses. In verse 14, the Son's given the kingdom. In verse 22, the saints are given the kingdom. In verse 14, the Son inherits the control of the kingdom from the Father. In verse 22, who do the saints inherit the control of the kingdom from? Well, not the Father. Not even the son, actually. I mean, yes, the son institutes the transaction. Well, who controls the kingdom of men now? Well, it's the angels. The transaction, therefore, that happens in verse 22 is a transaction between the angels and the saints. Do you see that? That Daniel chapter 7 is, in fact, talking of two transfers of power, one between the father and the son and the second between the angels and the saints. Now let's put that together because it becomes very important when we come to Revelation 5. Come with me to Hebrews 2. Hebrews 2 has an interesting verse sort of all by itself in this section. And it says in Hebrews 2 and verse 5, a verse you know well. The apostle simply says, For unto the angels hath he not put in subjection the world to come whereof we speak. So here's the Apostle Paul, we believe, speaking of the control of the kingdom age. The angels govern the present age, but they will not govern the age to come. As Daniel says, that's the dominion of the saints. So the angels, at some point, are going to transfer their governance of the kingdom of men to the saints, that they can govern it. All right? Not very complicated. Now turn one page back to Hebrews 1 and verse 6. What do you make of this? And again, when he bringeth in the firstborn into the world, he saith, and let all the angels of God worship him. Now, it's poorly translated, and your margin indicates to you, when it says, and again, the margin indicates that the translators have had some debate about how to put these words in English. It ought to be, instead of, and again, as if to say, and in addition to the quotation I gave you in verse 5, where he says, and again, in verse 6, it ought to be, and when he again bringeth the Son, or the first begotten, into the world. That is, when Christ returns to take the kingdom age. When he comes to the earth again. That's the point. When Christ comes to the world a second time, then all the angels of God will worship him. They worshipped God, you know, when he came the first time. In Luke 2, verse 14, glory to God in the highest and peace on earth. When he comes again, the angels will worship the Son again. And you know, it's Brother John Carter, in his commentary on Hebrews, who very perceptively makes the comment on this verse, that when Christ comes to take control of the world from the angels, he will do so with some public act of homage, which he says... John saw in Revelation chapter 5. So there will be a specific moment in time, Brother Carter says, when all the angels worship him in some public act of homage, and that's described in Revelation 5. So come back to Revelation 5. What are you seeing, brothers and sisters, in Revelation chapter 5? Well, the answer is you're seeing two momentous transfers of power, aren't you? Revelation chapter 5 is the 50th year after the return of the Lord Jesus Christ to judge the household. The saints are on the, door, the, the dawn of the commencement of the millennial age. 
We know that because the sea is glass in Revelation 4, verse 6. The storm of judgment is over. Christ is on the throne, about to commence 1,000 years of reign. And the question becomes in Revelation 5, well, how did he get to that position? Well, it's very simple. There's a scroll. And it contains the unfolding future of the world. But nobody could open the scroll, it says in verse 2. Even a strong angel couldn't unlock this scroll. And John bursts into tears in Revelation 5, verse 4. What's going to become of the world, he says? Who can possibly open this scroll? Don't worry, John, says one of the 24. The lamb's done it. The lamb's here. He'll open the scroll. And then verse 6 says that the lamb came and he took the scroll from his father's hand. And he broke open the first seal. Revelation chapter 6 verse 1 erupts into life and a horse charges into the foreground of John's vision and the truth takes off into the Roman Empire at the hand of the bowman. And from their vantage point on the dawn of the millennium in year 50, the saints look back at that event 2,000 years ago and they cast their crowns to the, to the ground. The four living ones raise their voices in the song of Revelation 5, verses 9 and 10, because they have now just become the kings of the world for the next thousand years. And so when they say that they has made us kings and priests, what they mean is, you've just done it. You've just, like this instant, you have just made us kings and priests of the world. And it's not just the saints, as you know, because verse 11 says, of chapter 5, And I beheld and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne, and the living ones, and the elders, the number of whom was 10,000 times 10,000, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the land that was slain to receive power, riches, and so forth. There's the fulfilment of Hebrews 1 verse 6. There is all the angels of God worshipping him. You see? This is the public act of homage that will yet take place in the future. But do you see what's happening here? What you've got in Revelation 5, verses 11 and 12, or 9 through 12, this is the fulfilment of Daniel 7, verse 22. This is the transfer of power between the angels and the saints. The saints shall take the kingdom as Daniel 7 says, they has just made us kings and priests. We have taken the baton from the angels that have governed the world for 6,000 years, and we're going to take it for the next 1,000 into the kingdom age. That's the celebration of Revelation chapter 5. Two enormous transfers of power. One between the Father and the Son in chapter 5, verse 6, and the second between the angels and the saints in chapter 5, verse 10. Unbelievable. Now, did you know that Philippians 2 was talking about that? And now we come to reflect upon the Lamb ourselves. You see, it was in the Garden of Gethsemane that he faced the cross. And an angel came to him and strengthened him. Words, in fact, directly from Daniel chapter 10. Now, we don't know exactly what the angel, most probably Gabriel, I suppose. We don't know exactly what Gabriel said to the Lord in the Garden of Gethsemane. But it may well have been the context of Daniel chapter 7, the prospect of him meeting the father that he loved that he had never seen. Because understand, what you just read in Daniel chapter 7, when the Son of Man came before the Ancient of Days, was the first face-to-face meeting between the Lord Jesus Christ and his father that ever took place. And at that meeting, there was a transfer of power from the Father to the Son because the Son was worthy. That's what Daniel 7 spoke of. And it may well have been, that may well have been the context of the discussion between the, the angel and the Lord in the Garden of Gethsemane. And the point of me saying that, you see, is that it was the joy that was set before the Lord that propelled him toward the cross. Well, what greater joy could you, could you consider than the prospect of meeting the Father and taking a throne beside the Father. And as the first century came to a close, the Lord now has one last message for his brethren, for the saints. And he gives that to John on the Isle of Patmos, and he says, John, open the door, and look at this, John. What do you see, John? And what's the prospect, brothers and sisters, of the vision of Revelation 4 and 5? Well, simply this, that the saints might also receive a kingdom. 
that they might sit with him in his throne as he is currently set with the Father in his throne. So you see, we talk about the joy that was set before the Lord Jesus Christ. What about the joy that's been set before us? Can you understand the enormity of the celebration of Revelation chapters 4 and 5? Just exactly what the Lord has shown John for us in these chapters. And now we come to the emblems. Just pause and consider what it cost the Lord to give us this vision. I mean, he had to become the lamb, didn't he? He had to become the slain lamb. He had to overcome like no one has ever overcome. If it wasn't for him, brothers and sisters, we'd all still be there weeping with John in verse 4 of Revelation chapter 5 that there was no man. But because God saw there was no man, he gave a son, and that's the son. And everything related to him, that's the son that we remember now.